Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman Hochberg and Secretary Thomas Perez, U.S. Department of Labor. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, your rapt attention all morning. And uh, I'm very fortunate to be here with uh, not only a colleague, but a, a, a person I've called a friend over the last few years, uh, Secretary Tom Perez. And um, I want to, again, in the spirit of our conference, get right into it. Um, just last night, uh, we had the first vote on uh, Trade Promotion Authority in the Senate Financial uh, Services Committee. Uh, some finance committee with a 20 to 6 vote, a very broad bipartisan vote. And clearly, the subject of the day is uh, trade promotion authority and ultimately the trade agreements so we can support more jobs at home. So, can you help our audience here better understand why that's so important mm -hmm. for the United States? Why, this, why all the emphasis on this? Well, uh, it, it may seem odd to have the Secretary of Labor talking about that question, uh, and uh, I've been very involved in this, and you know, the, the question presented is, you know, we, we look at the last six years, and the President set forth a very ambitious goal of doubling the number of exports, and we met that, and that, that translated into something like 1.7 or 1.8 million export-related jobs. We know that export-related jobs in the aggregate pay better. Uh, than other jobs. So if we're trying to address the issue of wage stagnation, the more export-related jobs you create, the better. And uh, for me, the challenge here, and uh, I speak as someone who uh, has very close relationships with my friends in labor, and they were my friends yesterday, they'll be my friends tomorrow. We've been having a lot of conversation about this. And, and the question presented is, can we improve on the status quo? You know, and, and the status quo right now is that uh, the playing field isn't level. I, I was out on the West Coast uh, trying to mediate the ports dispute a couple months ago, and we were able to bring that to a successful conclusion. And, and one thing I learned there, talking to farmers, for instance, uh, their future markets are in Asia, and the playing field is not level for farmers. You know, you want to you export to Malaysia, and you have significant tariffs. And so when you create a level playing field, you add more farm-related jobs. Uh, when you create a level playing field in the auto industry, you know, whether it's Japan, for instance, where you have tariff and non-tariff barriers, you improve um, you know, the outlook for more export-related jobs. And, and I spend a lot of time at the Department of Labor with our colleagues. In, we have an International Labor Affairs Bureau. And we go to places like Geneva and advocate for robust ILO standards to make sure that people are treated fairly across the world. And, and the status quo right now in, in countries like Vietnam, uh, for instance, is that there is effectively no right to uh, organize. The status quo in Mexico is that it is very hard right now, effectively, for an independent labor union to organize. And so for me, the question presented is, can we meaningfully improve on the status quo? Can we build a trade regime that goes to school on the mistakes right. and lessons of history and NAFTA and builds a trade regime that truly puts um, American workers first and that has meaningful labor protections and environmental protections built into the DNA of the agreements themselves? In NAFTA, for instance, a country's obligation was you have to enforce your own labor laws. Well, you know. The labor protections in Mexico were next to nothing, meaning no disrespect to my friends there. And now what we're doing is we're baking ILO provisions relating to ILO the International Labor Organization, which is, you know, there are many, many standards there relating to fair treatment of workers, relating to um, minimum wage laws, relating to you know, basic working conditions. And so what we have in TPP baked into the DNA is these sorts of protections that every country would have to come by. And, 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 and so when I go and when my colleagues at our International Labor Affairs Bureau go to these conferences, we are often accompanied by our friends in organized labor who are saying rightly that we have to advocate to improve working conditions in places like Vietnam 
in places like Mexico, in places like Malaysia. And for me, TPP is the opportunity to do that at scale and to go to school, as right. I said, on, on the lessons and mistakes of history. And that's why um, I think we can meaningfully improve on the status quo and build a trade regime that, that would have the impact when you are raising wages and uh, work conditions, that's going to raise living conditions overseas, and that in turn raises the cost of production overseas, and that in turn is good for American workers. So does the Trans-Pacific Partnership essentially correct some of the shortfalls in, in the NAFTA agreement that has gotten, frankly, our friends and labor so upset? Sure, I mean, you know, the, the NAFTA agreement was our first effort at scale uh, to, to really uh, address labor agreements. But the problem with NAFTA was that labor agreements were side deals. They weren't baked into the DNA of NAFTA itself. And so when you look at NAFTA and you look at the, the proposals that are baked into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you now have labor agreements that are enforceable in the agreement. So labor is treated no differently than intellectual property. It's treated no differently than, you know, anything else in the agreement. Labor was a stepchild in NAFTA. Labor was a bit of an afterthought in NAFTA. Labor is now uh, at the adult table in TPP. And let me give you one example. Uh, you know, under the NAFTA regime, if, if a country is violating a labor provision, uh, they can effectively pay a fine in perpetuity. So it's, it's a cost right. of doing business. That's, that's, that is not a good regime. That's, that's not a meaningful deterrent. And in TPP, we change that. So if you are uh, continuing to violate a labor provision, that, then we have a system of graduated sanctions so that you can be held meaningfully accountable. Right. And so, again, it's, it's called going to school on, on the lessons of NAFTA. And I, I think we're doing that in TPP, and, and it has the most protections. And equally importantly, Fred, um, we're dramatically revamping how we enforce because um, you know, my friends in labor make a very good point when they say, you know, you have to do it faster. Justice delayed is indeed uh, justice denied. And that's why the president issued an executive order a couple of years ago establishing an interagency council basically of trade prosecutors, uh, folks who have you know, expertise in this area. And, and we're dramatically revamping how we do these things because we have to do these cases uh, better, and, and this administration has done more cases in the WTO than any administration prior, and we've won every case uh, that we have brought. We've been very aggressive, but we have to do even better, and that's what we're committed to doing. So what's the story that doesn't get out? I listened to you. We participate in a lot of meetings about why this is such a good thing, but it seems like we still have a credibility gap, but we still have to re push back against some long-held beliefs. How do we do that? Well, I mean, I, I, um, I understand and appreciate the skepticism that some bring to the table uh, in this because uh, it's kind of a fooled you once, shame on you, fooled you twice, shame on me. You told me at NAFTA that this was going to be good for workers and, and there were winners and losers. You told me in uh, CAFTA that it was going to be good and they feel like they're winners and losers. And so I, I, I understand and, and, and frankly shared and share some of that skepticism. The, the, the question to ask is, are we content with just doing nothing? Right. Because if we do nothing, then foreign countries can trade with us in our, and we have effectively little or no barriers, but we can't do the same thing there. So I keep thinking about those farmers that I met during the port dispute who want to expand their business even more but face an unlevel playing field. I want to fix NAFTA. The best way to fix NAFTA vis-a-vis -vis Mexico is to do what we're trying to do in TPP, to address some of the, the, the weaknesses that currently exist. And if you throw up your hands and say, I can't do anything, right. well, then you're, the status quo, um, in many respects, is not good for us here and is not good for American workers. And, and the problem is, many of us, if you can't get what you want, they prefer the status quo than something else, which is a mistake. Well, again, you know, I, I, this has been a, I, I appreciate the fear that, and, and trepidation that folks have. Uh, and, and, and that's why the president has taken, you know, the time that he has taken. Right. And, and I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I have a lot of faith 
in the president's commitment to making sure that we put American workers first and foremost, and that's been his North Star. So what, um, just pivoting to, we've talked at the last panel, uh, Penny Pritzker mentioned it, others mentioned about STEM education, the importance of STEM, so that we have American workers who actually can therefore compete globally. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, and how do we also get more kids engaged in sure. that? I know well, you're the labor secretary, not yeah, education, well, but I know you have a. I bet you have an opinion. Well, we, you know, we, you know, we're Match.com. That's what we do at the Department of Labor. <laughs> you know, our job is to uh, match job seekers who want to punch their ticket to the middle class with businesses who want to grow their business. And here's the good news: um, everywhere I go, I have the same conversation with employers. Whether it's, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Western New York. I'm looking at HSBC there. I grew up in Buffalo been to the HSBC arena uh, many times. And, uh, you know, I, I was in Syracuse recently talking to an advanced manufacturer and uh, had the same conversation with them, which is we have a global footprint uh, and um, we want to grow our business and our biggest challenge is finding the skilled workers to do our business. They're actually taking some of their business to their UK factory right now because they don't have enough welders. You, you, right now, we have 5 million job openings as we speak right now. Uh, 500,000 or um, one-tenth are in IT-related jobs. And you talk to folks in the IT sector. You can't get enough folks there. If you have a cybersecurity certificate in the D.C. region, you have a job uh, because there's that much demand. And the list goes on. The same thing in healthcare. And so what we're doing and what we need to do, Fred, and, and it, it, it includes but frankly transcends um, uh, STEM, is, is we have what, right, what I call, we're having an Eisenhower moment right now. We have, you know, Eisenhower brought us the interstate highway system. And we're restructuring dramatically. We're transforming and building the skill superhighway. Because, and, and Jim McNerney and I have had this conversation many times. Uh, when I visited his plant in Renton, Washington, uh, roughly a third of their workforce there is within seven years of retirement. So wow. this issue right now is front and center in their conversation, succession planning at scale. And, and, and what we need to do is build a skill superhighway, and we need to construct on-ramps and off-ramps. One of the main on-ramps, and, and we've had many conversations with Siemens about this, we need to construct or reconstruct the on-ramp of apprenticeship because you know, I travel to Germany, I travel to UK, and I'm, I'm traveling to Switzerland next month. And, and when you're a 15 or 16-year-old um, you know, young man or young woman, you, know, you, you have that fork in the road and you have the apprenticeship fork or you have the higher ed fork and both those forks lead to the middle class and we have as a nation over a series of decades, this is not a partisan comment, this is an indictment on all of us, um, we have devalued this. And, and we've done it to our detriment. And, and apprenticeship is not simply something that applies in the skilled trades. You go to Germany and you see apprentices in IT, you see apprentices in healthcare. You go to UPS today, you see apprentices in logistics. And so we need to construct that on-ramp. And by the way, you know, when you get an apprenticeship uh, certificate, you know, it doesn't preclude higher ed. You know, I, I refer to apprenticeship as the other college, except without the debt. And uh, That's a good and, thing. And, and we, need, we, we need your help because um, this is a dramatically helpful on-ramp that we can construct that can help just about everybody in this room uh, who wants to grow their business. And, and, and so those are examples of on-ramps and off-ramps. And what we're doing is working with all of our partners in the federal government. We're working you know, with Arne Duncan to, to construct career pathways, to really reinvent you know, how, how we address STEM issues. And, and, and this is really uh, you know, ground zero uh, to, main sure, to ensure that we maintain our global competitiveness. Which countries, you mentioned Germany, you mentioned you've done a lot of travel, which countries do you think might give us some clues of things we might do differently here? Is it that apprenticeship, sure. higher ed fork? Well, certain, certainly Germany is one. It's, it's not a coincidence that the youth unemployment rate in Germany is less than half of what it is here in the United States. Uh, you know, young 
chill, you know, 14, 15 year olds have career pathways. Um, you go to Switzerland, um, and, and what we're doing is we're creating, um, we have a, what we call a leader program. We stole it. I, I've seldom had an original idea in my life. <laughs> I go to different places, I talk to business owners, I talk to labor leaders, I talk to local government leaders, I, I look at their good ideas, and then we steal and scale. That's what we call. Um, and, I like uh, that, steal and scale. Steal and scale. And uh, so we've created a leaders program, and this is stolen from the UK. I should use a different word than steal, because theft sounds a little, um, you know, we appropriate, uh, we replicate uh, these things. And, and what it is, is sector by sector, there's a, a, a remarkable advanced manufacturer, Bueller, uh, Swiss-based, and uh, they have a U.S. footprint in Minnesota, North Carolina, and uh, they have exported their apprenticeship model to the U.S., and, 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 and now they're evangelizing so these pay to other apprenticeships. businesses. Like, oh, absolutely. So it's apprenticeship like is the earn while you learn model. Right. And, um, and frankly, you know, and I've said this to businesses and other businesses like Bueller have said this to businesses. You know, we have to have more skin in the training game. I just met with the leadership of the organization of um, uh, the OECD, you know, which is the, they're based in Europe. Yeah. And, and that's uh, whatever we have three dozen countries or so that are members of the OECD. Right. You look at the U.S.'s investment, the, the federal government investment in um, human capital relative to other OECD nations. And the good news is we're really, we're, we're lapping Italy and Spain. And the challenge is we're getting our butts kicked by the rest of the OECD. And, and we underinvest at our peril. And that is why the president has been so committed to this skills agenda. That's why we've been working with businesses like Siemens and others to ramp up our efforts to invest. You know, cannibalization, businesses are discovering, is not, that's a zero-sum HR strategy. I steal your uh, good right. person at HSBC, and then they're going to go back to J.P. Morgan, and they're going to steal ours. And it's a zero-sum game. Right. So we've got to work together. And, and the big difference, and this is good news, is sectors coming together, understanding that we need to train more STEM workers. Sectors coming together, understanding that you know, let's, let's pool our resources right. on whether it's apprenticeship, whether it's other investments, so that we can indeed um, meet the, the good situation we have, which right. is that we have a wind at our back um, as a nation here, and, and this is a really, th this is a critically important um, challenge moving forward. Are there particular companies or industries you think do a better job of this? I know that, you know, Wichita, Kansas, we have a lot of the general aviation around Charlotte, where Siemens located, there's a lot of people in power technology. Are there some industries or companies in particular that are doing a better job at this? Well, there have been, I mean, I think there are great examples in every sector. I mean, um, you know, obviously in the auto sector, um, you know, Ford and, you know, the, the big three automakers have been doing this, and, and now smaller businesses in their supply chain are working with them uh, because uh, the big three have scale, and so they can do that. Uh, you know, Siemens has exported their model, and, and we've worked very, very closely with them. You know, the BRT, we've been working very closely more generally. You know, every sector, there are great examples. Again, the logistics sector, uh, UPS, has done uh, great work in this. In the healthcare sector, um, you know, healthcare has been a recession-proof industry. You look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, during the depths of the recession, we were still adding health, uh, healthcare-related jobs. And, and what we're doing is working very carefully to understand what the emerging needs are. And, uh, and that's where community colleges have played a vital role. Um, to me, community colleges are that secret sauce of success. Uh, I talk about the Department of Labor as Match.com. Well, the secret sauce in that match very frequently is our uh, community colleges who are very deft at um, responding to industry need and uh, developing credentialing programs that get people on that skill superhighway. And you stack one credential on top of another, on top of another, and then you have incumbent worker investments from business, and what you have are you know, the key to the 21st century success. Let me, we're, right, we're closing up on time, let me, uh, I was actually at the Wall Street Journal the first Friday of April, and meeting at 
8.30 and at 8.28, there was like almost a ticker tape watching the time come down for the jobs number. Um, the jobs number the first Friday of every month seems to have such an ability to move markets and a lot of power. Um, that feels like a change from the past. Do you have any thoughts on that? And are we also counting the right number? Well, I think we are. Well, we count many numbers. We have six different measures of unemployment. Uh, and on every single measure, whether you use the broadest or the narrowest, the unemployment rate has been coming down. Uh, 61 consecutive months of private sector job growth to the tune of, you know, we're really, you know, when we're talking about, you know, 11, 12 million jobs, that's, that's real progress. And that's not the only indicator of success. You know, we, we also do a report every month on turnover because one of the best indicators of uh, a robust economy is churn. You know, people, when people have confidence to um, voluntarily leave their job, that's a sign right. of good economy. And you know, last month, roughly 2.8 million people voluntarily left their job. And in the depths of the Great Recession, it was something like uh, roughly half of that. And uh, we have 5 million job openings now, another bellwether of right. Uh, a well-functioning economy. And, and obviously, the, the, the challenge that remains here, Fred, is to make sure that the wind that's at our back results in shared prosperity. Because the job numbers that I'm citing, you know, we haven't seen this robust growth since the late 90s. The difference between the late 90s and now is that the growth we saw in the late 90s um, lifted more boats, resulted in more shared prosperity. And, and I talk to people you know, across an ideological spectrum. You know, people everywhere who understand that when we don't have shared prosperity, that hurts everyone because 70% of GDP growth is consumption. When people right. don't have money in their pockets, they don't spend it. One of the most frequent things I hear from business owners is that this has been a consumption-deprived recovery. You know, I, I speak uh, periodically with Lloyd Blankfein at, uh, at Goldman, and, you know, he, he's somebody who has been as... Um, conspicuous as anyone in this country in talking about how um, inequality uh, is a threat to everyone. And, uh, and, and that is, you know, making sure that our growth results in shared prosperity is, I think, the major piece of, of unfinished business. I agree with Lloyd wholeheartedly. And, 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 you know, to bring it full circle to the trade discussion, you know, when you increase exports, you increase wages. There, there's no one panacea to address right. the issue of wage stagnation. We need multiple strategies, but one good strategy is to make sure we have jobs that pay well. And you know, the jobs at Boeing, which is one of our nation's biggest exporters, if not the biggest the exporters, biggest. Uh, you know, those are pretty damn good jobs. Good jobs. Uh, and uh, you know, the jobs at that uh, advanced manufacturer I met um, outside of Syracuse, you know, the, the thing, I grew up in Buffalo, and the lament of my parents' generation uh, is that all? So many of their kids had to leave because right. the economy dried up, and and I, I spend time in Central New York. It's become a nanotech hub, uh, and 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 I talk to people there, and they say my son and my daughter are going to be able to stay here. You know, I'm not going to have to go and visit them somewhere because we're we're bringing back um, uh, good jobs, and that's what it's all about. And that's why you know I have um, with enthusiasm. Uh, been engaged in, in TPP efforts and, and skills efforts. Uh, you know, there's so much really that unites us and, uh, and, and making sure that this wind in our back results in shared prosperity is in my mind, and I think in the president's mind, the number one domestic piece of unfinished business. And everyone in this audience is uh, playing uh, a, a critical role in that effort. Well, I see our time is up, so let me thank you for taking time out of your day to join us today. I really My pleasure. appreciate it. Thank you for your Thanks time. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. It was great.